Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. In this episode, Terrell Givens sits down with Stephen L. Peck, an award-winning author and scientist, one of the most bright and interesting Latter-day Saints you'll ever meet. For Peck, as for Givens, Mormons need not fear scientific research because it can be a wonderful avenue for getting more acquainted with God. We miss opportunities to see that, 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 that what we think are stumbling blocks or challenges to our belief. If we would get out of the defensive mode and instead enter a more creative engagement with some of these realities as they exist and are made manifest in the world, that, that, that they lead upward and onward in really fruitful ways. But I'm sorry, did you No, go that's, ahead? That, that's, that's a really important point because it's so true. In my life, it's the beauty and wonder of the universe that actually makes me excited about Mormonism because it embraces that. Right. It embraces <clears throat> this idea of uh, eternal growth, it's Terrell Givens speaking with BYU professor Stephen Peck on this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations. Hello and welcome to another conversation. My name is Terrell Givens and my guest today with me in the studio is Associate Professor of Biology at Brigham Young University, Stephen Peck. Uh, a fellow Tar Heel. Yes, and, uh, yes. We go back a long, long ways. We do. We were in graduate school together. That's so. right. That's right. Um, good to have you with us today, Thank you. Steve. Thanks good for coming. Here. Steve, you're a, um, an ecologist, a philosopher of science, a novelist, uh, an essayist. What am I leaving out? <laughs> <laughs> I watch a lot of TV. So. <laughs> We'd like to start by... Uh, Explain a little bit your background, your uh, your intellectual as well as spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. Take us back to what you think were some of the seminal moments in your life that might explain how you got to where you are today. As far back as I can remember, I've sort of been interested in life. When I was five, my parents got me this giant set of plastic dinosaurs, and they had little cavemen. And, and then we had a thing called Brontosaurus. They've, they've been reclassified. Kind of like Pluto, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, which, which was both hard on me, but then I grew to accept the, uh, the, 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 the changes. <laughs> but um, so I've always had this interest in that. I, my, uh, my mom would always brag that I knew the names of all the dinosaurs, but there are only like 10, so it's not as big a deal as it, it sounds today when there are literally hundreds. Yeah. Um, and. And for some reason, I spent a lot of time outdoors as a kid. Um, partly, I think, because we didn't have the didn't kind of screens. media. We didn't have a screen. We didn't. It was my mom would immediately shoo us out, and we would explore the world. And we spent a lot of time camping. My dad was a uh, social worker, and he ran this camp way up in the Rockies in the summer called Dead Horse Point in Wyoming. And we'd go up there, and I can remember floating on rafts and looking down at the bottom of the pond and seeing things. I, didn't, I had no idea. No one could tell me what they were, but there were, there were dragons down there climbing on branches. I, I know now that they were dragonfly larvae, but I, I had no idea at the time, but it just captured me. It just, I, I, I wondered what, they, what are these? How do they work? Why are they in the pond? And I'd see little fish and frogs. The, the, the pond was full of leopard frogs that we'd catch and, and, and let loose and do all kinds of things with. And I think at some moment, my, my, my parents bought me these Time Life books and there were things like the, you know, life on earth, early man, and then the scientist. And between that and the professor on Gilligan's Island, I was completely <laughs> sold on the idea of being a professor. I really. So is it a pretty straight line trajectory from early childhood uh, dreams to? Not very straight. Uh, I, I went in the army, was in Germany for two and a half years. In fact, I knew Fiona. Uh, there. Did you really? She was part of, yeah, she was part of the young women's. There. She never told me that. Oh, yeah. Ask her. You know, I, I, I probably wasn't very memorable. I was one of the GIs that, that hung out in the, the Frankfurt Youth Group. And right. But I actually yeah. sat next to her on a bus from, 
Frankfurt to Birch's Garden. We had a great talk. I learned she was from, from Kenya and right, and, right. Uh, and so um, yeah. So we have connections that go yeah that go yeah. way back. Um, uh, and so uh, and at the at the time I joined the army, I wasn't active in the church. I I. I Spent a lot of time in Moab, kind of wandering around the, the landscape. That's where I was. Scholar in Moab? Yeah, scholar in Moab. There are some parallels. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I joined, joined the army, but it was shortly after I joined the army that, that I came back to the church. I met some, we had a wonderful chaplain. Uh, he sort of steered me back. On, on the course, and, and as he steered me back on the course, the, the, the idea of being a scientist kind of entered into me, and I was a long ways from that at the time. I served a mission in That's interesting, these two things seem to happen simultaneously, because of course, one, one of the distinctive features of your work, both as a scientist and as a novelist, is the interweaving of those two things. Right? Yes, yes. But we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, exactly. And, and in my writing, they're not exactly out of, biographical, but they are out of my experience. I, I use my imagination yeah, a lot, yeah. but um, but it was it was uh, so no pivotal moment, no particular episode that stands out. Just a kind of gradual return back to your home faith. No, it, it actually was. Um, I was having a hard time in the army. I mean, at, at the time, I was I was hanging out with some rough characters. The uh, the army, a, a guy on NPR said that when I was in the army was the worst condition of the U.S. Army in U.S. Army history. It was right after the Vietnam War. Everybody was kind of discouraged and depressed in the, the upper echelons. Uh, very low morale, very, very, a uh, lot of drug use, a lot of alcoholism. And I started to remember the good things about the church. And there was kind of a pivotal moment. Um, bless my mom. Uh, she wrote a letter to the company commander at the church and said, my son's there somewhere. Could you go find him? And he, uh, he sought me out, uh, invited me to church. I don't think he expected me to come. But you did. But I did. And the interesting thing was, though, is um, I do my laundry on Sundays. And I, the, the, the uh, base chapel was on my way. And I would pass people, and I said, those are Mormons. I knew they were Mormons. I could just tell. They were all standing out there with their white shirts and, and ties. But there was also an affinity there that I recognized. And I recognized they were Mormons. And every Sunday, I would pass them out. And just before he contacted, this is my faith-promoting story, just before he contacted me, I would see the missionaries walking down the street everywhere. I, I'd peek out of a, a, a window for just randomly, and there would be the elders walking by. Or I'd, I'd step outside the barracks to go to the, the PX, and there would be the elders walking by. And, and it just played on my, on my mind all the time. When he contacted me, I was ready. I thought, yes, yes, I want to come back. And I did. And, and that's when I decided to serve a mission. And, uh, Which was where? Uh, Arkansas. Right. I, I didn't quite learn the language, but... <laughs> and then you went to graduate to college and graduate school. Uh -huh. there. I went to BYU. I I majored first in zoology. I was in a horrific car wreck on my honeymoon. My wife and I were. Uh, were you distracted? Is that what happened, Steve? I was distracted, but I think the drunk driver is what did okay. us in. <laughs> Middle of nowhere in Oregon, we come over a rise, and there's a guy that's lost his control of his car, and we 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 spent the first six months. Uh, recovering from that. We, we spent a long time in the hospital and then recovered at her parents' house. And I got really afraid of, of I had a couple of friends who had graduated in biology and, and they had not really found jobs or anything. I thought, well, I better do something safe. And I, I, had a, I went on this, um, right before this, I'd gone down a biology field camp. And one of the professors, who's one of my colleagues now, um, probably wouldn't mind if I named him, uh, Dennis Shizawa, he, he, I was a joint philosophy biology major, and he said, you know what, what you need to do is study math. If you really want to be an ecologist, you're going to need math. And I thought, oh, math. <laughs> and he said, you've got to get at least through calculus. So I started taking the preliminary classes, 
I fell in love with math. I mean, just just became completely enamored with it, and uh, ended up uh, majoring in statistics, and uh, went to UNC for a master's in biostatistics, and then did my doctorate in biomathematics. But um, it served me well for becoming an ecologist. He was absolutely right. 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 But I never lost my love of philosophy. That was kind right. Of, that's evident in your writing. Yeah, that was that was always my my sort of mistress on the on my yeah, yeah. my my discipline on the side while I. <laughs> so most people probably who know you know you through your your fictional work yeah. rather than your scientific. Um, you know, when I'm approaching an author or a novel, <clears throat> and I usually encourage my students to take the same approach, I think one of the most fruitful ways to get into it is to ask the question, what, what question kept this author awake at night that eventually led them to write this work as a therapy or as a mm -hmm. resolution of that question? Um, and I'm just going to take a guess that, that the question that motivates so much of your work theologically as well as... as, well as uh, fictionally, is what the heck am I going to do for eternity? Yes, <laughs> yes. So um, I want you to talk a little, a little bit about that. Your, was uh, A Short Stay in Hill your first work? It was, uh, was that after a scholar? It, actually, uh, it was a children's novel called Rift of Rhyme that really didn't do well. <laughs> okay, um, but, but um, Short Stay in Hill probably one of your best-selling best works. It is. And it's a deeply disturbing work right? Uh, in which you, you're trying to come to terms with... with uh, an experiential, right, kind of picture yeah. of what eternity might look like. Right, right. Um, so talk a little bit about what motivated that, and did it resolve anything for you? I think, I think what it did was it made it more important for me to envision an eternity of adventure, intellectual adventure, um, rather than an eternity of doing the same thing over and over and over again. I think a lot of times growing up, I had the impression uh, that eternity was pretty much just kind of running this soul business where me and my eternal spouse would, would, would make thousands and millions and billions of, of humans that we'd run through this earth life and, and get them up into heaven so they could do the same thing. A factory almost, for exaltation. Right, right, right. Almost a pyramid scheme of, you know, getting more and more. I'm going I'm to interrupt you right there because yeah. you've, got a, you've got a passage that speaks to this in your most recent book, um, Gilda Trilling. And you say, one of the characters says, you'll remember how crazy I used to get at my father's ridiculous view that God and the eternities were just an accumulation of more stuff. More family, more children, more and more acquisitions of worlds, an eternal game of Monopoly with more and more squares on the board, and more and more houses and hotels piling up on the spaces. Ah, how boring that seemed. An eternity of the same game forever? You'd have to have some sort of heavenly opium to keep you happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's exactly was this deep existential angst in me. And, and I think, I don't think it's just particular to you, right? I mean, yeah. I think this is really uh, something that a lot of us grapple with. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, Kant talked about a whole series of antinomies, right? A whole right. series of these either ors, both of which are equally unpalatable, right? Mm -hmm. That space has an end, that doesn't make any sense. That space, space doesn't have an end, we don't want to think of that either. Right. <clears throat> and eternity is the same kind of thing. We don't want to think our existence comes to an end. But oh my gosh, the, the spectacle of unendingness is, can be horrifying. My son, my oldest son, for example, says he's not, he's not afraid of death. He's afraid of eternity. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I resonate with that. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think A Short Stay in Hell was actually sort of a stripping down and exposing the length of eternity. I think that's, that's, that's it, it, and I have to say this carefully because it's, it's not like that's what I tried to do. What I tried to do is to work through my feelings about, about eternity. And I just read uh, Borges' uh, The Library of Babel, right. which it plays a specific role. I mean, there's a sign on the yeah. wall of hell that says, this is modeled on right. <laughs> a short story. Borges' Borges Library. Borges. Yeah. And, um, and as I work through that, and, and, and so the hell's not that bad. I mean, your first impression of it is, well, this is a doable project, and you get out of hell if you find the story of your life in, the, in a library that contains every possible book. 
But as it unfolds, the dimensions of that library start to become more and more apparent, yeah. and the impossibility of the, of the task becomes they're, they're, they're there, I think. So there's a metaphysical question here. There's a theological interest. Mm -hmm. There's also a kind of scientific insofar as cosmologists, for example, grapple with how do we convey to the layperson the immensity of space, Yes. right? Yeah. And so you're dealing with those kinds of problems exactly. all as they intersect, it seems. And, and when they come together, it, it, it is disturbing. All of a sudden, you realize eternity is really, really long. <laughs> yeah. You can do, uh, and, and, and the, the odd thing is, is that one of the first claims that the book presents is that we're going to be looking at a finite, it's not even eternity, there's a finite limit to the number of books, but you can't ever get there. Yeah. It's too big. Yeah. And, um, and, and for me, what it does is it exposes... I think, and it exposed it to me too. It wasn't like this was my intention. It was like when I finished, I realized, oh my, oh my, this is a terrible, terrible thing to have to go through in eternity because there's too much. And, and this, 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 this played into my uh, thinking about novelty because I realized this is okay. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt you, but no, I, I want to transition. I want to segue okay. now into novelty as it operates in your scientific thinking and scientific apprehension. Yeah. And one of the things I'd like you to, to, to talk to us about is to what extent does science, your your experience, your view of science, solve this problem, and to what extent does your theological apprehension give you particular insights that you think have been useful in your scientific understanding? So how do they interact? Okay, let me start with the science part, um, because this this is it was science, it was evolution that actually sort of helped me rethink what eternity might mean, and 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 Good. gave me kind of an escape from the horrors presented in a, in a short stay in hell. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you again. No, please because, because this because because this is what I, I want to draw some attention to what you're saying here. You, you take a concept like evolution mm -hmm. that for many people is a stumbling block to the faith. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and for you it becomes a catalyst to a richer and deeper engagement with the faith. And, and, exactly. And I like that. I just wanted to point this out because I think that's so often the case that we miss opportunities to see that 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 what we think are stumbling blocks or challenges to our belief, if we would get out of the defensive mode and instead enter a more creative engagement with some of these realities as they exist and are made manifest in the world, that, that, that they lead upward and onward in really fruitful ways. But I'm sorry, did no, you No, that's, that, that's, that's a really important point because it's so true. In my life, it's the beauty and wonder of the universe that actually makes me excited about Mormonism because it embraces that. Right. It embraces <clears throat> this idea of uh, eternal growth. Of, of So talk it, a little bit in specifics okay. about evolution and how you see evolution fitting this model. Okay. So the, the wonderful thing about evolution is that it's wildly creative. Non-teleological. Non-teleological. Completely non-teleological. And yet all this diversity of things starts to bubble up. And, and the, the, it's actually in the nature of the universe. I mean, if you go back to, for example, the first generations of stars, you see a whole bunch of stars made of helium and hydrogen just kind of burning in the sky. And if you were a scientist that arrived there somehow, you know, scientists are a complex thing, so how they would arrive in the early universe. But we can imagine, we can imagine the, we can imagine Doctor Who, for example, traveling back to the, to the, the early universe. But if you didn't really know where it was going, you'd look at You'd look at the, the, the stars, and you'd calculate how much fuel these stars had, and you would say, uh, in so many years, these stars will all burn out, and uh, we'll have a, a dark gray universe. Everything will, will, will go cold. Go cold. Um, not knowing that, that when too much of this stuff gets together, gets together, and the massive gravitational forces will force fusion, of, of these heliums, helium atoms and, and uh, hydrogen atoms, you create heavy, heavy metals and you create um, massive explosions that create so rocky structures. So you just keep rekindling new processes. Right. So something new arrives in the universe that, that, you know, beyond these simple structures, all of a sudden you get added complexity in the universe. You get, you get rocky planets, you get, get all in these second generations of sun, you have the opportunity for carbon and oxygen, two of these elements that get created in these massive explosions, 
to begin to recombine in really strange and wonderful ways. And once life shows up in the universe, it's off to the races because life provides a, a mechanism for memory so that, so, that, so that structures that are created can uh, uh, have, have, have a structure that can be remembered by the next generation. You know, people criticize, oh, science doesn't know how life got started. But they're making real progress, and there's things that appear, and it may come in, in my lifetime. I'm not worried about it, because unanswered questions in, in, in science are what feeds science. So I, I don't worry too much about, well, how did it get started? Because they're, they're making headway, and there are lots of good reasons to think. But once that happened, um, all of a sudden, you, you see the formation of cells, you see the formation of these single cell organisms of bacteria and archaea, these two things that existed. And I, I just had, I was just reading a book that gave the figures, but for, for almost several, several, a, a billion years, there was just these two bacteria-like things. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, the, 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 uh, one of these bacteria climbed inside one of these archaea created a cell and created a cell and it, it's the bacteria is still there it's our, it's our mitochondria it provides the the energy for all the rest of our cells and eukaryotic organisms begin to appear and then uh, new what happens is life itself changes the conditions of life which allows life to change into something new and this process continues and you get more complex structures is as energy begins to be competed for, and some become, come grab it from the sun, and others grab it from the ones that grabbed it from the sun. You develop these predator-prey relationships, which add to this complexity, and all of a sudden, no. diversity of life is just bubbling all over the place, and it's open-ended. You just don't know okay, where it's it going to go. Okay, it's at this point that your particular variety of Mormonism <clears throat> responds to this with celebration rather than angst. Yes, yes. Right, because it's at this point that the, the, the creationists and others say, well, well, wait a minute, we have to make sure God is always in control of this. God has to be in control of yeah. the process. Yeah. And, and if I read you correctly, what you're saying is, well, God's actually part of the process. He's, he's, he's in the universe. Right, right. And this is a universe that is characterized by the radical intrusion of novelty right. at every moment. And that is our salvation from an eternity of ennui. Yes. Right? Exactly. Um, I think now in light of what you've said, I'm coming to understand the phrase that you use in one of your writings. You refer to the sanctity of complexity. Yes. Um, yes. So talk a little bit about, about that. How is, how is the complexity itself sacred for you then? It's, it's, <clears throat> it's sacred because it's kind of the opportunity for something truly unique and wonderful to come into the universe that's never been there before. Uh, the, 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 the appearance of, say, a giraffe. I like to see, and I don't know. You know, this is this is this is my own theology that that comes out of my my evolutionary leanings. But I get hints of this in Job, where where Job's complaining about things aren't going. You know, if you were just, you'd be taking care of me better than this kind of. And and he and God comes to hear complaints, but God doesn't really address the issue. He just says, "Have you seen these wells?" Whoa, they are great. These wells, they're wonderful. Who saw, you know, and kind of like the first days of creation right. too where he, where he discovers you were you were saying this earlier to me, right? It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's good. This is marvelous. You know, you couldn't catch one. You couldn't even catch one of these, let alone make one. Try to get a hook in this baby. It's too big. <laughs> and I kind of see in that my own delight and wonder, and I'd like that to be an attribute of God at the discovery of what's unfolding. And when God saw a giraffe, he had the same reaction. Would you look at that weird thing? That is just wonderful. See, just wonderful. I'm going to quote you again. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. You, you wrote, if God cannot be surprised, then he cannot laugh. And if he cannot laugh, then he cannot weep. And if he cannot weep, then we are nothing but real after real of a motion picture. See, to my mind, right? I mean, Fiona and I have written about this. Yeah, yeah. God's capacity to, to weep is not what reduces him. It's what magnifies right. him as a being worthy of our worship and adoration. Right. And if I if I thought I couldn't do anything to surprise God, then what's the use of any of it? To me, that kind of God 
is so much more awe-inspiring. The, 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 the fact that God can experience awe is 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 marvelous to me. It 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 as you as you as you described, it's what makes him worship worthy. If if God is just a part of a grand machine that's tick-tocking through repeated bouts of things, it's it's not very interesting. It's never occurred to me until this moment that doesn't that always also suggest that if God if we want to worship a God who only exists outside of space and time and history and temporality, mm -hmm. then aren't we diminishing creation? Aren't we saying, oh, this is all just window dressing that we're going to pass through in order to get to the real stuff? Yeah. And so it seems that by making God a part of the universe, we're also sanctifying all of the material universe and saying, no, this is sufficient right. for right. us. Right. And, and I, I think that's exactly right. I think... How can you have a, a theology of environmentalism or ecology that's predicated any other way. And that's exactly what I was going to say. When you realize that, that creation isn't a wave of the hand, that it required deep time. And to me, this makes creation even more valuable. This idea that creation took several million years to unfold to where it is, to where it was ready for the presence of his children. This, to me, means that Earth itself is sacred in a way. This is our home. And, and I find this a wonderful idea because we know that our eventual home, if we go to the celestial kingdom, um, will be the earth. Right, right. This will be our home. And the fact that our bodies are constructed and, and evolved to be ready here, it's, 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 it's marvelous to me. Is it your belief, your experience as a scientist, that emerging sciences of complexity, of chaos theory, science of emergence, that these all corroborate this picture of, yes, of an I think unpredictable so. universe? Yeah, I, I think it does. I think determinism, determinism was always an assumption. There's no way to prove determinism. It was always a metaphysical assumption that everything's determined. We get Laplace's demon who, if knew that the position and right. velocity of every particle could predict the entire future of the universe. But that's not what we see when we actually start looking at things. We see, we see random mutations appearing. And those random mutations uh, can, can be the grist of the novelty that comes into the universe. And there's, there's, this, this doesn't mean that there's nothing predictable, uh, that, it, that it's random. I, I hear this complaint a lot about, about um, evolution, that everything's uh, random. But it, it's not random because there's selective forces. It, it means something to want to swim in the water. If you're an organism and you're going to evolve to swim in water, you have to have certain features. You have to have a way of, of balancing your direction, powering your motion, all these things. And uh, swimming things have evolved multiple times on Earth in lots of forms. There's things that swim like, like uh, squids or, or fish. But for vertebrates, a swimming thing has evolved three times. We see, we see it in the, the, the fish. We see a dinosaur fish-like thing. If you saw an ichthyosaur swimming, it would look very much like a porpoise. It evolved the same kinds of fins, the same yeah. kinds of, of tail movements, except, uh, oh no, mammals. And then mammals did it. So they, all three of these groups came out of the land, into the, or up out of the land and then into the water, except fish started in the so water. So as if they, all, they each find their own solutions. Right. And, but they all have this similar variety. And there's an extreme example of that. Uh, there's a, uh, a British um, biologist who's written this, this interesting book called Life's Solution, and he points out these kinds of convergence. And one of the most amazing is saber-toothed tigers. You have a, a marsupial saber-toothed tiger um, and a placental saber-toothed tiger, and they look very, very similar. Now, marsupials are things like kangaroos. They evolve from they all the the the, the entire marsupial line evolves from something very rat-like. It's a it's a little opossum that you know, superficially, you think, oh, that's a rat. And then genuinely uh, placental mammals that were very rat-like too. So both of these things are, are moving through this solution space, trying to, try, things that survive are those things that, are, that work better. So it's not better. utterly random. It's not utterly right. contingent. There's certain constraints right. that kind of direct the general course, right. which would explain, for example, how something humanoid 
might have been virtually inevitable, although right. the particular... And that's Simon Conway's claim, actually, is that the subtitle yeah. of his book is Inevitable Humans in a... In a, in a Contrary to what Dawkins and right. have claimed, that if you replayed the tape, yeah. it would be very yeah. utterly different. Yeah. Now, it's possible, but if you're solving things that are similar, if you want to swim in water, you have to do certain things. Yeah. If you want to fly, you have to do certain things. And insects and, and fish and pterosaurs and mammals, whales and things all solve it differently, but there are certain solutions that, you know, I was talking about flight. So, so insect flight, um, bird flight, uh, flight, mammal flight, pterosaur fl flight, the, the big dinosaurs, they all have wings. They all have to do the same thing. And so there are constraints imposed on what it means to be a biological organism on Earth right. that you can't get around. If you want it to survive, you're going to be the one that does those things best. Yeah. And so it, it, evolution refines them towards that things. But even within there, there are things, though, that there's nothing necessary about a blue whale or there's nothing necessary about a gi giraffe. Right. I think that's why the Lord in Job is so delighted with that. Look at that. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> and it does. And, and, and to your point, um, it does give us reasons why we should preserve this unique thing that's come about. It's like a a canvas where this beautiful work of art has pl taken place that sh that's filled with uniqueness and that kind of value that comes through rarity. All the things that we see are rare and special and were produced over a long, long time. And I think the Lord values it highly. Right. I think he loves it. I think he loves creation. And I think it bothers him when we can't appreciate what went into creating these marvelous creatures. So. so let me back you up a little bit, <clears throat> because you were talking about uh, radical novelty, mm -hmm. unpredictability, complexity, and you actually find an intersection between how these words operate in the realm of science and mm -hmm. how they might operate in the realm of the sacred. Mm -hmm. And if I can quote you again, you, you write in Gilda Trillum, Christ's atonement is so powerful and important, it became necessary because of the situation that arose. It's a response to the emergence of a new smashing strike to which one must respond or lose the game. And, and when I read that, I was, I was struck by its similarity to something that Dorothy Sayers quotes in one of her works that I think is just one of the most beautiful insights into the mm -hmm. nature of, of divine morality, if, to use that term. She says, in this, in this morality of grace, the situation says, here is a mess, a crying evil or a need. What can you do about it? We are not asked to say yes or no, I will or I won't, but to be inventive, to create, to discover something new. And then this, the difference between ordinary people and saints is not that saints fulfill the plain duties which ordinary men neglect. The things saints do have not usually occurred to ordinary people at all. It needs imagination and spontaneity. It is not a choice between presented alternatives by the creation of something new. So are you, say, are you saying the same thing uh, as, as what Dorothy I, I, Sayers I was quoting there? I, I, I am, um, because I, 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 I really believe that. I really think that our situation on Earth requires our response, as she describes. It requires our imagination. It requires us to rethink things, to deal with the response. And it wouldn't surprise me if if that's exactly what the atonement is. It's a response to a need that's arisen in existence to take care of us. And, and that gives me hope that these tools and characteristics that I've been given of, of as she describes, imagination. Um, I, love, I love that because what she says is we often, we often feel like that there's a right thing and a wrong thing to do, and there is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this like categorically, There's, there, there are wrong things to do and there are right things to do, but so much of life in dealing with our kids, in trying to navigate the, the difficulties of, of relationships, of jobs, of everything, require us to, re, to act immersed in a situation that's utterly unique and utterly in need of our best thinking, our best imagination, and our freedom. And a lot of times we try to line it up and saying, okay, I've got to choose between two evils, when in reality, as she describes, we need to navigate these waters. It's, it's, it's not when we're on a ship that, you know, these waves are evil and this wind is evil or good. There's benefits and, and, and non-benefits, but we have to steer. 
And there are directions. There are places we want to go. There are places we want to get to. But there isn't a script. There's not a script. That's, that's yes. what I like about what yes. you're saying. It, yes. I think you're, you're trying to endow Mormon conceptions of agency with more heft. Yes. By saying it's not about choosing the right. It's about creating the right. Yes, um, exactly. We, we, we're here to paint a portrait, not to memorize right. a script and act out a role. Right. Our, our lives are works of art. They're not a... A, a, a monopoly game to try to get to the end and and make the right moves. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's what am I going to create of myself? What am I going to try to create to, to glorify God? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is one of the most beautiful things that Marilyn Robinson says in, yes. her, in her novel yeah. Gilead. She yeah. says she has the preacher say, "I believe in a God who will judge us, maybe in terms of how beautiful our life was." Yeah. And yeah. there's there certain people you know that sometimes they strike you that. It isn't that they're necessarily a, a righteous, good person. They're that too. But somehow they're living a beautiful life. Yeah. I mean, I happen to think my wife is one of those people that I, I look at the way she lives from day to day and there's just a beauty, a loveliness yeah. to that. And I think aesthetic comes right. closest the right to word. describing what, what, what that is. Um, I want to change gears okay. now, if we can. Sure. And given the nature of the interconnectedness of everything you do, it's not really changing gears <laughs> too much. But I want to talk about your fiction. Okay. And I, I'm going to begin with, with a passage from one of my very, very favorite poems. Uh, it's by John Ciardi, and it's called The Gift. And it's a poem about a man who survives Auschwitz or where a concentration mm -hmm. camp and comes home and, and relives his life. But the poem ends with these words. In the spent of one night, he wrote three propositions. That hell is the denial of the ordinary, that nothing lasts, and that a clean sheet of white paper waiting under a pen is a gift beyond history and hurt and heaven. And yeah, I'm moved by <laughs> those like words. Yeah. I'm moved by those words yeah. because I think what he is talking about is writing, the craft of fiction is a simulacrum of sacred creation. And this is an idea also that in some ways goes all the way back to Descartes and it, and mm -hmm. it weaves through Wordsworth that at no moment in our existence are we more fully alive and fully free than when we conjure up worlds out of language. And uh, some authors I read and, I, and I'm really struck by the profundity of their ideas or the lyricism of their style. But I have to say, when I read you, <laughs> when I read a work like, like Gilda Trillum, I'm struck by the sheer joyfulness <laughs> of the exercise of writing. In some books like Gilead, I, I read that and I think, man, I would like to have written that work. Mm -hmm. But when I read you, I think, man, I want to go and write a novel too. Because <laughs> there's a joyfulness, a, a, a playfulness in your writing. Um, that's not to say that it isn't laden with, with beautiful, beautiful moments of insight and inspiration. But your writing is very deceptive. It's very weird. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Those who've read A Scholar of Moab or, or, yeah. or Gilda Trillin especially, because it, it masquerades as a kind of flippant, whimsical, almost uh, surrealistic exercise in l linguistic play. Um, and yet it's, uh, it's full of theological and metaphysical insight and probing. So talk to me a little bit about, about your writing. Have I got it right, do you think, in some ways? I, I, I think it's a reflection of the joy that I take in writing. I, I, it, it, to me, it's one of the one of the. It's kind of a necessary thing. It's it's a, a joy to me to get to know these characters, and and often. So I don't I don't I don't like do an outline and then map out where everything's going. I yeah, have, no, I had the sense you don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I absolutely don't. And and a lot of times, what happens in my books, they're very organic. Is I am as surprised as the reader. I, I, some, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be literally writing going, wow, I didn't see that coming, <laughs> you know? Um, because um, it, it's, it, it is, it's, it's very organic and evolutionary. All of a sudden new structures appear that I didn't see and they demand. Um, um, give us, if you were an artist, like Brian Krasiczynek, I'd have some mm -hmm. canvases here that the audience could look at. Yeah. It's hard to kind yeah. of summarize, but give us a 30-second overview of what Gilda Trillum, your most recent book, is, so they can have some sense of. So, Gilda Trillum, um, it's, 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 it's kind of contrivance is that it's a master's thesis by a, a, 
a guy from OM named Kit Wixom. And um, he's following the life of a Mormon... Uh, badminton champion. Badminton champion, poet. Um, and, and, and there are some playful things, like it, it, it says she's a minimalist author, which means she gives you the words. <laughs> and you have to put it together. You have to put it together. And then I go into these academic debates about what it means. I have you to know? say, I, I, I felt a little bit that I was the target of some <laughs> some parody here when it came to the English profession and <laughs> literature. Yeah, the, the English professors were... were yeah, yeah. Were, but the plot yeah. is really irrelevant, right? Yeah. The plot is an excuse. Right, right. It's like Don, it's like Byron and Don Jew, and it's an excuse right. to go off in any number of right. tangents and directions. Um, I'm going to read a passage. So she, so she's, go you know, I was just going to say, she's, she's exploring the world, and she's trying to find... What, what, what is existence? What is exi the existence of things? What is the existence of me? And ultimately, it's a question of what happens when new things come into the world or I find new revelatory experiences that change the very foundation of who I am and what, yeah, yeah. what, 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 what does that mean? How, yeah. how, how do I handle that? What role do they play in my life? And, and, and what role do they play in other, other people's lives? And... Um, yeah. uh, and it is, it, 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 is, it is a sort of joyful look at all those questions. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm going to read one passage. Okay. We don't want to spend too much time okay. because many won't have read this. But this passage I'm going to read, I take as typical of many passages, that when you read it, your first inclination is, well, that was kind of a fun, whimsical thing. But then you go, wait a minute, is there... Is there something serious going on here? <laughs> so I hope so. <laughs> don't, don't ruin it for us, but, but talk okay. a little bit about this. You have, a, you have a section in there where Gilda is writing on the ecology of the junk drawer. Is that right? We got uh -huh. the title right? Yeah. The yeah. ecology of the junk drawer. And immediately, right, everybody will conjure up. Oh, I know exactly. I yeah. get a picture of that, right? We all right. have one. Right. And here's a partial description. The wallet is huddled in the upper left corner, and its height has prohibited the pencils from mounting its leather covering, and it sits alone almost. A daring bottle top has secured a purchase on top of the billfold, anchored by its rough corrugated sides. The cap's hold on the wallet has also allowed two rubber bands and a pipe cleaner to negotiate an agreement to keep them topside and secures them from falling. And it goes on and on and on. Yeah. But now, one way of reading this is as a kind of parody of academics uh -huh. <laughs> who couldn't write, because famously, for example, um, uh, Jacques Derrida did a, a, a whole reading of a designer gene label at a conference, and that was his talk, right? So you can make a mountain out of a molehill if you're uh -huh. right, intellectual enough. But, but tell us, what else is going on in a passage like that? There's a couple of things that I, I, I kind of want to point out. One is, it, it is, it is certainly a, a parody of an academic discourse on things, but it's also removed from anything alive. These are all objects, but I'm using terminology as if these were- Agents. Agents. And that they're they're the, the shades of Orson Pratt here. In the yeah, background. there may there may be there may be and uh, and and kind of um, the idea that that objects themselves are interacting in really interesting ways and it's producing results that and and conditions and it, it it's it's trying to get at this idea that so this is this is a little bit different from what I was talking about before but it's the idea that randomness itself can create a landscape on which things can play that's very, very different than, than deterministic forces. Right, right. And so it, it's, it's going to play into late, later novel as, a, as, a, as, as the appearance of, of agential action. But these, are, these aren't really agents, but they're, they're setting up a landscape where you can see how, if they were, this is how you'd describe it. Right, right. And so... So yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a totally fresh lens mm -hmm. through which to look at the familiar. Right. Right. right, And all great writing to some extent right. gives us that defamiliarized right. view. And the, and, and, and the limits of, of what, um, what can be known about a system. Yeah. Well, I think okay. it's brilliant work. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, I want to turn to one final general subject. Okay. Um, and uh, it may be something we want to explore in half a dozen subsequent conversations. Oh, I love that. These are my favorite but, conversations. But uh, <laughs> I want you to talk to us a little bit about what you think are some of, and maybe just kind of sketch some general mm -hmm. thoughts about, what are some of the opportunities uh, and challenges, uh, exciting possibilities that current and recent developments in science pose 
for people committed to a, a Mormon theological foundation? So to me, so th this, this will sound maybe presumptuous, I'm not sure, but to me, Mormonism is the perfect vehicle for a scientific viewpoint. It's very material. It's, it's very, very attuned to agential action. Um, I honestly think Mormonism is the, the religion best suited to an evolutionary viewpoint of the world and of existence and everything else. And that was pointed out by Witso and others, right? Yeah. Way back in the 20s right. and right. 30s. There, there wasn't the, the kind of fear. Right. Uh, but rather that they saw a perfect conformity of the evolutionary model, generally speaking. Right. To Joseph Smith's King Follett kind of picture. And I think that's right. I honestly, I, I, I think Mormonism, uh, we, 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 we talk about the attributes of God being intelligence and the importance of learning and wisdom and investigation of exploring the things under the earth and above the earth and, and uh, kingdoms and, and, and things. All these things are science. That's what science is. It's discovery, it's curiosity, it's, it's being struck with the awe and wonder of the world. And, and, and to me, that's always been a part of my Mormonism. That's what Mormonism lends itself to. Uh, this Brigham Young University itself established early on when, when pioneers are, are planting crops and doing things, we need an educational vehicle yeah. because, because the glory of God is intelligence and yeah. learning and knowledge. And, yeah. and My favorite statement in that regard, in some ways because it's almost so absurd, but it, it demands to be taken seriously, is what Brigham Young said about the earth being transformed into a glorified Urim and Thummim. Mm -hmm. And he said, how will that happen? And he said, by the angels who are best instructed in chemistry. <laughs> and it's this wonderful moment where, wonderful. He, where he collapses, yeah. right? What other mm -hmm. people want to make non-intersecting magisteria. Right. right. And he's saying, no, no, the no. sacred and the creaturely right. participate in the same realm. And the skills acquired in one are going to transfer to the other. Exactly. I, I love that. I do, too. I do, too. And I think, and, and, and this is, this is, why I, I think Mormonism appeals to me so much is that it just lends itself to being a scientist. I, 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 I think that the things that I discover about the universe, the things that I've learned, the, 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 the things that I study and look at fill me with wonder. And I get that attitude of, of God when he looks at whales and says, look at that, that is so cool. <laughs> Oh, this is just the stuff you want to talk about. No, we're going to look at whales. Whales. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. whales. Steve, this has been fascinating. Are there any, any concluding thoughts you want to leave us with on the, the nature of science and its relationship to Mormon and Latter-day Saint discipleship? I think one, one thing I, I, I'd like to add is there tends to be some fear about science. There seems to be some uh, suspicions about science because science is disruptive. It's going to take comfortable paradigms and, 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 and maybe turn them on their heads. Uh, for example, um, at, uh, the discovery of the Big Bang seemed to be a troubling notion uh, that, that life evolved when, when the reigning paradigm was that, uh, you know, God kind of created it all at once yeah. in a day or two. <laughs> Uh, and so that aspect of science, though, I think Mormonism can embrace better than any other religion and also in the sense because it's part of the restoration. We're used to the idea of continuing revelation. We're used to the idea that, that we need to change our minds from time to two, time as new information comes in. This, good is, point. this is what scientists do. If we're flooded with, with new information, there's always a few holdouts. It's a complex process. For example, the, the continents slide around on Earth. Uh, for a long time, that was an absurd notion by our currently, current understanding. There was no mechanism that could move continents. Yeah. And the old geologists resisted, that tooth, and resisted nail, that tooth and nail. And even though they'd see things, they'd see things that were, that were perplexing, like the, 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 you go down to a certain level in the strata of Africa and South America start to match up really nicely. But there was no mechanism to get them together or, or apart. And so you can imagine, well, maybe there was some big thing there that eroded away. But all of a sudden, 
people began to realize there is a mechanism. When we drill into sea cores, we see that it's spreading or collapsing. And all of a sudden we have a conveyor belt that's moving continents yeah, around. Yeah. And scientists have to change their mind. Sometimes it's really hard for scientists to change their mind yeah. and they'll hold on yeah. to these old paradigms. But when science really starts to, to hone in on something that, that's being supported by multiple data sets and being, being sort of our best thinking, it's time to pay attention, and sometimes this can be a, yeah, a hard I love, aspect. I love what you say about the restoration should suit us particularly well to an openness, a disposition right. to, to expect right. continually evolving, shifting paradigms of greater light and knowledge and understanding. Right. Uh, my two favorite expressions in this regard from Latter-day Saints, one is from uh, Henry Eyring, the, mm -hmm. the senior, right? The Lord will never require you to believe anything that isn't true. Yeah, yeah. And if, and if we would just remember that, and the second, I love that. Deep, kind of... profound wisdom from Elder Holland. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? He said this. If people get so right, worried about right. Ch challenges right. to traditional models, just, take, just relax. Yeah. Just relax. We're not yeah. going to have to accept anything that isn't true. And, and let things unfold. We, we get in a hurry. I think we want all our truth all at once. Yeah. And, and sometimes in science, we don't find the answers for a long, long time. Well, the restoration wasn't an event, right? Right. It's, a it's ongoing, yeah. It's ongoing, yeah. I, yeah. It's part of science. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, final three questions. Okay. What do you think is a people we're doing well at this particular moment? What I see I, that I'm excited about is the, 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 in, the openness to investigation and exploration in, in things like um, the Gospel Topics essays. That uh, This is a series of, I think, 12 or 15 essays written by scholars uh, linked on LDS.org right. where they address some of the most... Uh, pressing issues and questions about Joseph Smith's polygamy, the priesthood ban, these other issues. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think that's been very, very healthy. That's, that actually models how science works. Right. You, you, you open the investigation and... And, and, and ask, what have we learned in the, in the last learned? years that shed new light on right. this problem? And, and it may be that those will be ongoing document as we learn more, as we understand more, right. and they should be. Right. Um, science itself, in a way, is a living text that that's never really settled it's 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 not something that oh well, we've arrived at the truth it's it's it's, it's constantly in motion and refining and asymptotically yeah, yeah. approaching things that are are settled enough that they're they're not going to change the probabilities get so low i always tell my students that science teaches us how to bet and so for certain things like evolution you know you're betting six trillion to one against it now you know it's, one in a trillion events do happen, but right. uh, that's not the way to bet. You don't go to Las Vegas mind. and you know think, right. okay, that's good odds. Um, and, uh, and, and that kind of, of transparency, science, one thing about science is you have to put out your data. You have to, to show what, what your analyses are. And, and I think that uh, is why science has been so strong. It's, it's, it's got mechanisms to correct itself. It's got people who are looking over your shoulder when I submit a peer scientific review. paper. It has to be peer reviewed. People point out mistakes or bad thinking and that makes me write a better paper. And then it still can be openly discussed and argued about once it's in the literature. Nothing ever becomes a set text. Yeah. And I, I see that in Joseph Smith as well. I see that in our... our Approving contrarities, truth is made manifest. Right, So this exactly. is kind of experimental. Yeah, exactly. Well, so what can we do better? Um, just one thing. One thing we could do better. Um, I, I think one of the things I, and this is related to science, is, is, is I, I think, and this is members of the church, this isn't, right. I'm not talking about, about, about a direction the, the leaders need to go or anything, but I think too often members of the church hold on to an anti-science viewpoint. Um, they become enamored with kind of evangelical approaches to, to young earth creationism or uh, intelligent design, these things that, that actually uh, subvert science itself and they subvert religion in a way. I think it's both bad science and both re religion. And, and to be less afraid when science is disturbing to, to, to dismiss it as a body of evidence and say, 
where are they in the process of elucidating this problem? Can I be patient? Can I see what they say and, and not react? And yeah. so I think that's... that's Be more scientifically literate yeah, and more exactly. open to seeing it as an ally in the quest for truth. Yeah, because I think it is. I think, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Steve, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And please, what keep a fun conversation. Keep writing. I will. I will. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>